Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of ClinBiz where we love connecting with you on the business aspects of clinical trials. So in today's episode, I have the very great pleasure of interviewing Anka Kopayescu, who is the founder and CEO of Strategicon. And we're gonna be talking about a few things, but especially the entrepreneurial journey within the clinical trial industry. So if you ever thought about innovating within the industry, this conversation is for you. So stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of ClinBiz. We're super excited to have here an interview today. Um, our friend, our industry friend here, Anka Kopayescu, who is the founder and CEO of Strategicon. So it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. Anka, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Um, so let's jump into just in terms, so you started, you know, your your career, you have uh, the experience during the zero, you have the experience on the sponsor side. So how did you make the switch um, from going, from become, being in the you know, industry roles, uh, corporate roles, to making the switch to becoming a software entrepreneur within the industry? So tell us a little bit about that switch and that jump, because I think a lot of people, uh, you know, that's where they sort of get stuck right? If they want to bring about innovation, it's right there in the beginning. It's making that leap. So share a little bit with us about that. Yeah. Well, next time when we switch the interviews, I'm going to ask you the same question because we, <laughs> because awesome. we have a similar background. Yeah. Uh, look, I get this, I get asked this question uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. And my answer is along the same lines. And um, that is, I became an entrepreneur out of love and frustration. I think the love part, it's easy to see because uh, I'm really passionate about transformation, about disruption, about innovation. And I have witnessed in so many um, uh, use cases, the power, the transformative power the technology has in uh, making uh, the um, clinical um, trial operations more efficient um, and really reducing the, uh, the overall uh, cost of, um, of running trials. Um, the frustration part, um, I think it's also quite easy to understand um, because the clinical business operations is, is largely a word of Excel and age technology. Um, if you are looking at the total costs of running clinical trials, about 85% of the costs are associated with uh, the actual execution of the protocol. And 15% are associated with supporting from a business perspective all of these uh, activities um, that are around the execution of the trial. So if you think in study startup, business operations is all about uh, clinical study planning, modeling, selecting the right partner, conducting the uh, due diligence in the outsourcing process. Uh, it's about getting into contracts, selecting the right partners. Then during the execution of the trial, you have to monitor the activities uh, related to um, the contracts that are in place. You have to manage vendor performance. Um, uh, there are uh, complex financial, operational, and project management activities involved. And at the tail end, of course, you want to be able to measure actuals versus plan like you would in any other industry. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, this area, which is so much of your focus, you are looking at 15% of the total study spend. Um, if you're looking at the amount of outsourcing, depending on the source, you're looking at 3.5 to $4 billion of investment by the industry on an annual basis. Um, and if you are looking at the, the uh, investment in technology, it's less than 1% of the um, uh, technology investment has gone into what represents 15% of the total study cost. So it's very easy to count in clinical business operations. There are less than 10 newcomers in the last 10 years. If you look on the clinical operations, there are over 300 solutions for pretty much everything you can think of in running the clinical mm -hmm. trials, recruiting patients to, um, you know, EDC, CTMS, and all the other systems that are already so organic to running trials. So this disproportionate investment um, uh, in technology versus the uh, investment that the industry is making and the expenditure that the industry is making uh, is, is, has 
convinced me that this is a tremendous opportunity to improve, to change that balance, um, and to uh, bring about the uh, power of technology in transforming uh, such a significant and critical um, aspect of running clinical trials. So it's all Excellent. about listening, passion for clinical business operations. Excellent. Awesome. Driven a little bit by that frustration. <laughs> Very much so, since I think you know, having uh, come from the pharma side, uh, yeah. this is this is a heavy Excel um, generic tools or H technology world. So yes. um, happy yes. to be part, at least a, a part or a small contributor of that overall transformation. That's great. No, that's great. Um, so important. So with with these things that you have mentioned, I think it's it's going to jump into our our first official interview question here. Um, regarding what your thoughts are around what are some of the top, uh, or let's say, let's see, the three most important success factors that you see um, for a company in such a conservative um, industry such as pharma. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, well, um, if I can point to the number one, uh, and then two and three may not be necessarily in, in the order of priority. Uh, I think the most important ingredient of success, regardless of the industry, um, is the people. Um, people are, are really everything in any entity and particularly in, uh, particularly in an entrepreneurial journey. Uh, you must be able to recruit top talent, uh, retain, which we know retention, it's quite challenging today, especially in a world which is so global. Um, and with such flexibility and in work mobility um, and uh, bringing talented people, retaining and motivating uh, them. It's, it's, it's one of the uh, most important success factors. And also I can tell you as a CEO, uh, one of the, uh, my biggest challenges, it's, it's very, very difficult to build a cohesive culture um, in a company that is large and virtual. Uh, and uh, we have now um, uh, 13 global locations. Uh, we are in uh, eight different countries. Um, and we <laughs> have these type That's of amazing. meetings from morning to night. Um, and um, we don't always meet the people that uh, we recruit. Uh, the interviews are largely by phone. Yet every single person that joins strategic, joins strategic and joins a vision and joins a family and uh and um i hope that spirit and enthusiasm and passion for innovation and transformation um so to me people are the most important thing if anything is going to break or make strategic on it's going to be the people um if i can think of the other two um particularly relative to your question of uh, how conservative the industry is we know, um, and I've been told uh, when I, I, I decided to start on this journey, I was told by one of my mentors, look, um, pharma industry is an industry of delayed gratification. And I didn't quite understand what, what that gentleman meant at the time, but it makes complete sense because that delayed gratification speaks to the journey that it takes to bring innovation and transformation mm -hmm. forward. You have to have patient, you have to listen to the customer's voice, you have to go through uh, sometimes a difficult journey of adoption because uh, many industry leaders surprisingly are so attached to Excel and so inclined to see the, the cup half empty versus half, pull, uh, half full that they don't give enough chance to technology to prove its value and the value is not only sustainable uh, but it's significant. Um, so I would say um, um, the, the late gratification comes from persistence, from listening to the customers and proving the return on investment of technology. And at the end of the day, there is a gratification of seeing an industry transform. And if, if, if I'm thinking about the third aspect, I would say it's luck. Uh, timing and luck. These are outside of our control, but you and we all need a little bit of luck and hey, timing is everything. Um, so uh, a great idea has to happen at the right time with the right people. And that's, I, I think, the recipe to success. Right. No, absolutely. I think I, I read in a book, a um, business book called Soar, I think, um, that they talked about uh, riding the wave. So that last mm -hmm. one you just mentioned, sometimes it's about timing, right? A little bit of luck, being at the right 
place at the right time um, for sure. But the foundation, like you said, the people is is definitely uh, what makes or breaks from all perspectives. So that's that's amazing. And tie it in with a little bit of patience. <laughs> Well, I, I would also say it's, you know, uh, an idea is as good as the execution. You can have a mild idea and execute it impeccably and that leads to success. Or you can have a, a brilliant idea and the poor execution, you know, only going to lead it to failure until someone else is going to pick that good idea and execute well. Mm. So um, I think pharma is no different than other industries other than uh, it's painfully slow. Uh, I, I, I like going to conferences and hearing the industry leaders talk about uh, innovation, uh, mm -hmm. talk about disruption, and at the end of the day, investing so little um, in, in these critical elements of business transformation. But I think COVID has changed this paradigm. We see uh, a whole new wave of adopters, of believers, of disruptors, kind of joining um, this uh, business transformation initiative, which which runs across all the dimensions of clinical trial and for that matter, uh, across all industries. So it's really exciting to be an entrepreneur now. Um, so that's, I guess, yeah, one of the absolutely. pluses of COVID. Yes, yes, uh, you gotta put it on the positive list there for sure. That's all right. right, so along the same lines of what are success factors for a company, um, what in your perspective is our success factors for um, product development? Um, specifically, uh -huh. and also what around that also, what is your product development philosophy um, that you personally have? Okay, well, um, you should have seen, uh, you should have listened to a presentation I gave earlier today. Um, uh, it was all about uh, customer-led product advancement. Um, we believe that the customer is really at the center of everything we do. Clinical Maestro was not built as a hobby, um, as a, you know, a good idea uh, in a certain industry to solve some uh, supposed pain point. Uh, it was built by industry experts who felt the pain of working in Excel, of, of, of building budgets in this manner, of sending uh, RFPs um, uh, by email in, in spreadsheets that had hundreds of of lines and oh boy, so many tabs with so many connections and receiving back emails in similar fashion that we, we didn't just dream of, of fixing a problem. We have experienced it. And at the heart of what we do is the customer voice. Initially, a lot of our own ideas, but now the product is in the market, is being used, and it's outside. Uh, it's no longer our baby. It's, a, it's, out, it's outside of our realm. We have such a rich product development map with over 400 ideas coming from the customers. Uh, every time the customer uses the product, um, we love their feedback, whether it's a new feature, whether it's um, some, um, um, you know, a new way of, of or use case of, uh, of the product that could be beneficial to them. Uh, we've been investing uh, quite a bit of effort now in, uh, for example, um, adding functionality around uh, adaptive uh, trial design, modeling complex studies, particularly for oncology. Um, and uh, the customer is really at the center of everything we do. Um, we had our first user forum um, last um, November in Boston and two uh, new products emerged from that forum. And guess what? Um, both are, have legs and, and both have started five months later. Um, so amazing. it's really putting the customer at the center and building the products that benefit the end users, uh, not uh, not that benefit the software company. I don't know if um, if this I think comes natural when you are the developer of the software, not when you are acquired of software, because then the solution becomes more of a cash cow and a maintenance. But for us, as we are developing the software, um, the solution is an incubator of ideas. It's a reflection of the user community. And we are seeing so much passion from our users who really want to contribute on um, creating features, building products. I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite amazing to uh, grow a company in which the owner of the product is, is actually not us, it's the customer. So that's our philosophy. That's, that's super smart. That's amazing. And I think that's a smart um, 
it's a smart step for any entrepreneur to really uh, listen to, I mean, we always talk about listening to the customer, but really, like you mentioned, having the customer develop that product further, um, that's a, beyond anything that's super smart, right? Because they're, they're really taking um, the lead on it. And at the end of the day, they are your customers. So it does make sense what do they want, right? We like, we like to do this at Climbiz too, whenever we're, you know, putting up an event or not, or don't, doing something, we like to ask the people because really, that, that's your main audience. You really need to know what they want and not just behind a desk trying to make, you know, decisions. And I love that you mentioned um, that, you know, Clinical Maestro, and we'll jump into a little bit more about Clinical Maestro now, um, that it was developed not by, you know, just a, a software developer somewhere that just wanted to, that saw a business opportunity and just wanted to do it, but it was developed out of, you know, industry pain points from subject matter experts in the industry, people really living the day in, day out. And I think those are, you know, the best chances of those ideas succeeding is when that happens, because you really, uh, at the same time that you're, you know, leading that company, that you're creating something, you know, you're also the end user. So you really get to to tackle some of that, those pain points. Uh, no, so I have to say so I'm much. the first tester of everything we do, uh, because if I wouldn't Excellent. use it, I would I wouldn't expect anyone else to do it either. Now it's way uh, you know outside of my hands, but I actually enjoy that product creation probably more than anything uh, in 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 Strategicon, and I will say that there is something about being part of innovation that we are recognizing in the users. And it's it's not about talking. It, it's it's not talking about features. It's not like I would say, hey, with Clinical Maestro, you can build a budget, you can create an RFP, you can uh, I don't know track actuals. So instead of saying these are the features, the way I think about the product is with Clinical Maestro, you can uh, budget faster, you can gain efficiencies, you can um, trend and analyze. Uh, the data and the intelligence that resides in your uh, own um, bids. So it, it, it's a very different way of looking at features versus the benefit that, you know, what, what's in it for me? What, why should I um, abandon my, my loved Excel spreadsheet to use your system? And the question is, um, is always not because of the features, but because of the benefits that you as a user will have in terms of speed efficiency, analytics, transparency, visibility. And then if the user cannot answer why, we cannot, we, we can, we cannot push features that um, uh, do not uh, really bring about real benefits. Super smart, super smart, amazing. So in, in that same line, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Clinical Maestro, describe it a little bit for those who are not aware of it yet. Mm -hmm. I, I think most people should be aware, but if they're not, mm -hmm. they get to know here. Uh, describe a little bit about Clinical Master. Is it primarily a costing tool? You, you kind of touched on a couple of those points now, but give mm -hmm. us a little bit more um, in depth about Clinical Master and, and, and what it is. Okay. Look, we are an ecosystem of solutions, um, uh, both for sponsors and CROs. On the CRO side, we have uh, three distinct solutions. Um, they, this is a modular system, so each solution can be used as a standalone. Uh, but is designed to work in concert, since this is Clinical Maestro, right? <laughs> and in harmony, to use another musical word, with, with the other uh, applications in the ecosystem. Uh, we started uh, well, a kind of almost in the logical ways you would run business operations. So we started with a planning and the budgeting uh, application. We call it Portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, we launched it in 2018. It was an absolutely fertile time for us to start an application because um, there were only two alternative solutions in the market. Uh, one uh, sunsetted already um, uh, last year. Uh, the other one is over 15 years old. Um, and we saw a true opportunity to modernize the entire process of planning and budgeting, uh, have a completely um, fresh look approach, build a solution that is highly configurable, that is extremely user-friendly, that it's uh, really built around analytics, 
and that can accomplish several goals, which is uh, do independent and joint operational and budget planning, be able to estimate with greater than 90%, uh, 95% accuracy is our goal, um, the uh, cost of a clinical trial that helps both outsourcing right. teams and finance teams, of, of course, uh, but also project management. And uh, the key of our application is, is actually the ability to run scenarios and compare impacts, which has proven extremely timely during COVID. You know, we had a portfolio run um, and run and run for so many scenarios during COVID, uh, whether uh, timeline changing or using a decentralized model or uh, changing location or any combination of impact, which is so critical, not only for planning a study um, um, that is new, but also for a study that potentially would have gone on, on hold. Let me interrupt uh, you real quick yeah. there, Anka. Mm -hmm. Yes. How long does it usually take to run a scenario in that? 12 in, minutes. 12 minutes. Yes. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> 12 <laughs> minutes. So for all those that know how long it takes to run those scenarios uh, when there's a request, 12 minutes with Clinical Maestro. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 you're joking, but with, uh, this is actually a quote from a customer, depending on your skill level and the level of sophistication that you want to put, it li literally can be between five minutes and an hour if you wanted to build a really, really complex scenario. Uh, but, uh, but that compares to weeks in Excel uh, and a level of accuracy that it's, uh, it's completely different because it's backed by fair market value. So this is our portfolio application, our starting uh, point. Um, we um, started our second application, which is our fastest growing. We call it Source. Source is just beautiful. Um, I mean, you'll see uh, me smiling about it because it's a complete transformation of the outsourcing process. Um, when used in conjunction with portfolio, you can automatically create an RFP based on a plan that you have already created. Um, and you can do very sophisticated bidding, you know, bidding to resources, bidding to expertise, bidding to specifications. Uh, we have a dual portal with the vendor. It increases dramatically the transparency between the sponsor, the CRO, and for that matter, any other, uh, any other service provider, because uh, source can be used to um, uh, gain bids from uh, a CRO as much as a central lab or an EDC provider. Um, so it's a very broad application. It's um, the first fit for purpose SaaS solution for sourcing. And we are measuring in excess of 75% efficiency versus working in Excel. Um, really beautiful due diligence and the most common use case right now um, and the, the area of the fastest growth for us is the management of strategic partnerships um, with, with uh, CROs in a full outsourcing model. Um, there's no better way to actually control the different parameters of a strategic relationship, be it rates, fixed costs, uh, or agreements than in this formula. I hear That's a bit of an way. echo. Is it on me? Um, okay, not anymore. I was okay. a bit of an echo. Okay, okay. hopefully no ho hopefully it's okay on the interview. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see. But um, okay. no, and I didn't then, hear. <clears throat> okay, and then I would say that the, our third uh, application for sponsor lead we launched okay, so hold during on. the pandemic. Yes. Hold on. Give yes. like two seconds. Mm -hmm. Just go like mm -hmm. two seconds and then you say our and. third. Okay. And okay. then we'll pick it up. Go ahead. Our third application lead um, is also a first to market solution. Uh, to our knowledge is the first uh, SaaS application for um, contract activity management. Uh, it starts uh, where it source ends upon uh, a, a word of a contract and it enables not only the tracking of the actual activities and milestones completed throughout the duration of the clinical study, um, but also the reforecasting uh, of the study. It supports project management teams, it supports finance teams, um, and it's very much loved by the CROs um, and other service providers. So we are quite thrilled um, that LEAD uh, has come to market and it's only one year old. Amazing. Awesome. Well, tell us, tell us a success story because, you know, mm -hmm. people like to hear uh, about other people's business. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us a success story for Clinical Maestro here. Okay. Well, I can think of, of quite a few. Um, 
I'll tell you one early success story, actually, uh, with, uh, with a biotech company uh, using our portfolio application. In this particular case, um, the company was in negotiations with, with a, a top pharma player uh, to partner on a development of a compound. And they were quite advanced. They already had a number um, advanced in the negotiation that the uh, strategic partner was going to contribute to. Um, I happen to know uh, the decision maker um, in, in, in that organization. And we initially just ran a, a courtesy scenario on that uh, particular um, uh, company. Um, the numbers that came out of Clinical Maestro were about twice as high uh, then what was initially negotiated, we actually started an engagement. We've done um, all sorts of models. We were able to capture a lot of nuances and, and, and cases, not only on that particular study, but on the entire clinical development plan. Um, with that information, the biotech company was able to negotiate uh, a significantly larger investment um, from uh, the pharmaceutical partner. Um, and uh, it was overall a very successful uh, strategic engagement, not only for us, but also for our partner, for both partners, the biotech and the, and the top uh, pharma that um, leverage Clinical Maestro to support the uh, planning of an entire clinical development plan and a strategic partnership. So um, this, is, this is a very nice success story. I like to tell it all the time. Yeah. Uh, there's another one, actually, we have a, a case study that it's going to be published very soon. Um, this one, it's a sourcing a success story. Um, it's uh, with a company in the Bay Area, um, massive selection of a CRO. Um, I think there were seven bidders initially. Uh, we have done the um, fair market estimate um, in uh, the portfolio application. So the outsourcing team knew what to expect. Um, the RFP was built using the assumptions from plan. So that was also appreciated by the CROs because they had a high granularity in assumptions. Um, I believe there were not only seven bidders in the first round, but there were three bidding rounds. And then we, then we went from seven to maybe to four to two. So three rounds of bid revisions all through Clinical Maestro. The entire due diligence was, was automated. Uh, the uh, ability to not only compare with a click the different bids, uh, let's say, of a, of, a, of a given player, but also the uh, different versions of the bids among different uh, bidders uh, led to a whole level, a uh, whole different level of refinement. Uh, the long story is that this, um, this particular company uh, saved uh, close to a million dollars from the due diligence alone through the use of Clinical Maestro, which represented about 10% of this particular study cost. And more than anything, they have done it in half of the time uh, that they would have if, if they followed the, you know, the traditional uh, send the RFP in Excel, get back the emails, save the documents in a file, mm -hmm. someone puts Excel side by side. So uh, it was not only faster, but it, it, it yielded significant savings um, and, and a whole new level of analytics and visibility in sourcing. So um, For sure. you will see the, uh, the case study is going to come uh, very soon on our, on our uh, website. Excellent. And a lot, a lot less errors for sure. Um, yes. And a lot of fun because people <laughs> just like to click on buttons and say yes. compare. Absolutely. So <laughs> it's, like it, it, it's significantly easier. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It, it gives That's the power fun. back to the sponsor. That's amazing. Um, amazing. Million dollars. That's great. Um, so you, I think you mentioned already, obviously, but just confirm to us um, in terms of who, who Clinical Master is mainly for. Um, mm -hmm. Is it only sponsors or CROs? I did hear you say CRO. So just confirming um, mm -hmm. if there are solutions for CRO on the CRO end of things as well. Uh, yes, uh, so CROs and not only CROs, I like to call them clinical service providers. So we are an ecosystem that can serve all the uh, providers uh, that support clinical trials. Um, I would um, 
on the sponsor side, the uh, clinical service providers are indirect customers of ours because they bid in our solution. Um, and um, we need to support them throughout the bidding process. Mm -hmm. And if they um, are using us for reporting, then um, uh, they're also uh, in entering information clinical maestro uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, but we do have a product dedicated for the CRO. It's called Core. It has been launched in September. Um, it's uh, gaining a lot of attention. We recently um, did a webinar with industry leaders roundtable talking about the need to introduce a smart SaaS solution for costing. Because guess what? Um, the CRO is no different than the sponsor. And in, in terms of using Excel for costing, but but for the CRO, costing is bread and butter. If, if, if one thing a service provider needs to do is to price, and pricing clinical studies is non-trivial. So if you are thinking that maybe um, an RFP template or a bid is complex, um, just try to imagine what the, the CRO spreadsheet looks like. Uh, the potential of, of errors, the potential security breaches, the, you know, all it takes is a, a, a wrong macro or a formula to, mm -hmm. um, to cause uh, a severe damage, uh, actually in pricing and, and the ability to have all the pricing in the same uh, database and do analytics is maybe important for sponsor. It's vital for the CRO. Sure. Um, so uh, a core is our uh, newest product um, and we're super excited. There's lots of information on our website and it's truly a revolutionary product. So again, you see me smile. I love core and I love source. I love all of our products, but these are, I would say my two favorite because they're very geeky. So. You can so play in them. <laughs> and I get myself doing that in the weekends, which, you know, it can be considered geeky by all accounts. <laughs> it can be. It can be. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> it's a good thing for, for many um, in the industry, for, for sure. Um, so that's great. Thank you so much for, for sharing those things with us. But now, you know, we like to know um, things that are coming up. So give us a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, in terms of new things, I mean, you guys have some pretty new products that just came out too, so that's great. But give us a little bit of a sneak sneak peek on whatever you can. Obviously, uh, what what do you have coming for Strategicon, uh, Clinical Master? What what do you guys have in the works <laughs> that we can share okay. with our audience <laughs> well, here? That's shareable. Well, let's say, give us a little bit uh, of a sneak peek. Okay. Well, um, I, I mentioned um, that we have um, hundreds of, of, of ideas in our product board and we uh, go through roadmap uh, reprioritization so many times because even with the high cadence of releases that we have, there is so much that we still want to do and that there is so much to innovate. Um, but I will give you a sneak peek uh, in that um, from our user forum in November, um, uh, there was a unified theme around um, the need to introduce technology into vendor management. Um, this was also, in my professional experience, the uh, most complicated uh, part of the infrastructure built in clinical business operation because vendor management, as you know, it's non-trivial. Uh, to manage vendor performance, you need to look into so many uh, uh, aspects of that uh, performance. So it's operational performance. You want to know the level of qualification. You want to know uh, the quality status. You want to know um, the uh, outsourcing experience, for example, the bid val volume or the win rate. You want to have visibility over all of the contracts uh, that you have with that particular um, um, a provider and you want to be able to easily gather all this information, uh, into one place so you can uh, assign a risk score and you can look at governments, uh, you can look at governance, uh, from a metrics perspective. So mm -hmm. this is, um, such a, a difficult area to tackle. Uh, but when it's difficult, okay. it's exciting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so this is our newest project. Um, uh, we call it vision and, uh, vision it's, um, it's, it's because it's truly is a visionary product, 
but it the the vision theme that I like it's really about uh, visibility and transparency into vendor performance. So you'll hear more about that. It's also a breakthrough product. It's a first to market fit for 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 purpose uh, technology for for clinical vendor management, and it's a super exciting project. How exciting! That is amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. So you heard it here, people. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> all right. So one last question, Anka. Um, and I really value this um, coming from you as you know, an industry expert for so many years and continuing to be an industry expert. Um, and especially our focus around clinical business operations here at ClinBiz. So what do you see um, in the future? What do you see as the future for um, clinical business operations? So I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Um, look, I'm a believer uh, <laughs> in transformation. Um, I, I think that um, we are going to look back 10 years from, from now on uh, and we're going to laugh of the old ways in which we were doing things. I can't imagine how an industry that is so rich and so innovative from an R&D perspective will continue to uh, source using uh, Excel and, and, and do all the analytics around, say, vendor governments on a spreadsheet. It, it just seems unthinkable. Um, and to some extent, we are asked all the time, why hasn't been a solution in the market uh, created until now? I, I can't answer why, but I can tell you that when we demo Clinical Maestro, we get so much aha, such as I've been waiting for this for so long. So transformation means one step at a time. It takes um, um, a disruption. Uh, it may take some people out of their comfort level. It might get other um, people right into their comfort zone because they are ready for change. Uh, and I truly, um, I truly see a global network of, um, of solutions, not only Clinical Maestro, hopefully will be leading the pack, uh, that will enable outsourcing teams project manager, um, a pricing uh, experts on the CRO and vendor side to work together in a significantly more collaboratively, uh, collaborative manner and, and really simplify the complexity that we have created around ourselves by having um, no standards and too much Excel. So I see things, if I can answer that in the simplest way, I, I, I see um, the future is being bright and I really see this uh, complexity being decomposed and, and simplified so we can spend more time on analytics than, than running spreadsheets. And this has happened. There are so many success stories in the industry. Um, so why not clinical business operations? I think this is uh, the elephant in the room that, that uh, we are tackling now. No, I agree. And I, I totally hope that's it as well. Um, so thank you so much, Anka, for joining us. It's truly been a pleasure. Uh, so before we wrap up, do you have any, any final words that you'd like to say? Um, well, I want to thank you. It's a pleasure to be on your channel. I know you gather around your community of, of innovators, um, of, of thinkers, and you, you are actually leading um, the innovation through communication in clinical business operations. So I congratulate you as an entrepreneur as well. And always a greatest pleasure to be here with you. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening, for watching. And until next time, see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you.